Good evening. It's good to see you tonight. If you will, uh, let's all stand together as we begin our time tonight. Jesus saves. <clears throat> we have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Bear the news every land climb the steeps and cross the waves onward tis our lord's command jesus saves jesus saves there's a call comes ringing o'er the restless waves in the light send the light there are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher ground. Lord lift me up and let me stand, my faith on heaven's table land. Plain that I have found, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When Take your Bible back to the book of Exodus, fourth chapter. And I believe we're down to the latter stages of the 20th verse. Exodus 4. Verse 20, for several weeks, two or three weeks now, we've been talking about doing God's will, God's way. And uh, Moses had the encounter with the Lord at the burning bush. And the Lord called him for, for a certain task. He surrendered to that task, and then he set about to begin to make everything ready uh, to do that. We talked about him bringing the family along, and we talked about him going back to uh, to his father-in-law Jethro and uh, not only his father-in-law but his employer and uh, making things right. Uh, then last week we talked about how that uh, for Moses, Moses was God's concern. In our life we're God's concern and uh, he spoke to Moses when Moses took that step before he ever got out of Midian but he took that step and he began to, uh, to make his way toward Egypt in that direction and God came and told him, he said, all those people that you're scared of that wanted to kill you when you left Egypt, he said, don't worry about them anymore. They're all dead. So, so God took care of all of those things. And, and that got us to the 20th, 20th verse. So let's begin reading in the 20th verse. And we're just going to finish that verse. And then we'll move, to, move on in, in Scripture. We'll cover two more things off of your outline tonight. And, uh, but we begin with the, with the rod of God. And verse 20 as a whole reads this way. It says, Then Moses took his wife and sons and set them on a donkey, and he returned to the land of Egypt. Now here's, here's where we left off, and this is the latter part of that verse. And Moses took the rod, depending on your translation, could say the staff of God in his hand. Now, what is this? rod of God or staff of God. It's not the first time we've heard about it. In fact, if you look back in, in your Bible to in this same chapter, back to the second verse, it's, that same, it's the same piece of wood 
that Moses has in his hand, when the Lord speaks to him and asks him a question, he says, what is that in your hand? And Moses responded to the question that God asked him, and he just responded. He said, it's a rod. Now, what it was at that time is it was just a a long, I'm I'm supposing, kind of like those that we see in the Christmas programs that we have from time to time, and it's about four or five, maybe six feet long or something in that ballpark, and it's got a big crook, likes a bit like a candy cane, and, and uh, without all the color. But, but back in verse 2, that's all it was. It was, just a part of the, it was just a piece of equipment that Moses had to have in order to do the job that he had been doing for 40 years. Now, when you get down here to this verse... It's no longer just called the rod. So what happens between verse 2 and verse 20? Well, it's a miracle is what happens. You see, what, what happens is, is this is, this very, it, this is the, the staff that God asked the question about in verse 2. It's, it's the same staff that God turned into a snake, if you remember that portion of Scripture. And, and, and after commanding Moses to catch it by the tail, he turned it back into a staff again. And, but now it's no longer the staff of Moses. It's no longer Moses' rod. Now it is the staff of God. You say, well, why is it now the staff of God? It's the staff of God because God touched it. God touched it. When your life is marked by God. Things are no longer yours. The things that, the things that we call ours, they're no longer ours. The talent that God gives us when we're in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and we know that he's touched our life and he's put a calling on our life to, to do ministry and to do work with the talent, the same would be with the ladies that play the instruments and and, and whatever talent it is that the Lord may have given us, if he's given us something, those things are no longer ours. They are now his. And this, this rod that used to just be a piece of equipment, standard operating procedure, kind of like the, what was that credit card they used to have the commercial, don't leave home without it? American Express? Well, the rod back in verse number 2, that rod that God asked Moses about, it was just a piece of equipment that as a shepherd you don't leave home without it. Well, now, in the meantime, it has been, it has been literally touched by God, so Moses takes the, takes the staff that God has touched, and it's a part of what he carries as he begins this journey, as he's making his way toward Egypt. F.B. Meyer, in one of his books, he wrote about this scene that, that we just read about. And he described it this way in a paragraph. He said, imagine the setting that day. Zipporah sitting on the donkey, perhaps taking care of a baby, while Moses walked beside her. And in his hand was the sacred rod. Only a shepherd's crook, but now it's the rod of God. Destined to be employed for deeds of transcendent power, always reminding Moses what weak things could do when they're wielded by strong hands behind them, end quote. Can you imagine how, how tightly? You ever held something in your hand that was sacred to you, important to you? And how, how tightly you hung on to whatever that may have been? Can you imagine this, what, what Moses and this staff what they've been through together. It wasn't just a piece of equipment, but it was something that, that he had seen with his own eyes. It had become a snake, and he reached down and grabbed it, and it becomes a rod again. It's, it's a rod that God has touched, and, and it's a staff that he has used probably for the majority of these 40 years, probably the same one. And I think as he is walking along the way, as he's headed toward Egypt from this Midianite country, that he is holding tightly to this, to this staff because it was a reminder of him of the presence of God in his life and, and the tangible presence of God. And he needed that right now because he's doing something he's never done before. God has put a call on his life, and he, he's 80 years old. He's older now than he's ever been before. And he's fixing to take on a task that he certainly has never taken on before. Then you get to that 21st verse, and and the Scripture reads, And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do all those wonders 
before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand. And then he says this, God's still speaking, but I will harden his, Pharaoh's, heart so that he will not let the people go. So in verse 21, God gives two things. One, he gives a command. And the command is simply this. When you go back to Egypt, see that you do all the those wonders before Pharaoh, which I put in your hand. That was the command. This is what you do, Moses, when you get there. But he also gave him a reminder. And we say a reminder because God has already told him this was going to happen. And the reminder is simply this, is that Pharaoh was not going to be impressed. Pharaoh was not going to do what Moses goes asking to be done at the outset. In fact, the scripture says that that the Pharaoh would harden his heart. And and I'm, I'm assuming that we all know this, I believe we do. Pharaoh is not his name. Pharaoh's a position, okay? So it's the Pharaoh, that's not his It's not his real given name. So he says, the Pharaoh will harden his heart and he will resist the voice of God. And God is just reminding Moses, this is what's going to happen, Moses, when you get there. So so, so don't forget about this. Now, now, I can't imagine a person, if you go back and and, and we just finished reading that 21st verse, but... but It's one of those head-scratching verses. You you ever have a head-scratcher? Sometimes your kids do something, and it's just a head-scratcher. Sometimes your husband does something, or your wife. I'm sure wives never do anything. It's just a head-scratcher. You you don't know. You're just not sure. You, you You don't understand what's going on. Well, as we read verse 21, the question, I'm going to be honest, it pops into my mind. What in the world is God doing? He's given him a command to go before this, what we would call the king, the Pharaoh. Go before the Pharaoh and do all of these acts, that, these wonders that, that he has put in his hand. But then he's saying in the same breath, he says, but he's not going to be impressed. It's just a, you say, well, God, I just don't understand. Now, you don't have to be honest, and I'll tell you that I, I don't understand what's going on. But one of the things that helps, and I don't know if you write in your Bible or not, but if you do, write out to the side of, of Exodus chapter 4, verse 21, write out Romans eleven thirty three and 34. Romans 11, verse 33 and verse 34. Because when we get to that place where we read that place where God has chosen an 80-year-old man to go, uh, an old shepherd to go and lead his people out of Egypt, and then he hardens the heart of the Pharaoh not to let him go, and we begin to wonder what in the world is going on or what gives, listen to what the Bible says in Romans, the 11th chapter. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor? Another New Living Translation of that same two verses, it reads this way, Oh, what a wonderful God we have. How great are his riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his methods. For who can know what the Lord is thinking? Who knows enough to be his counselor? The answer to that is nobody. Nobody. Nobody does. You see, maybe in our own life, we've come to discover this in, our, in, in some different experiences in our own lives. And that is things begin to happen. And, and, and I don't know about you, but I, I think we're pretty normal when we try to trace out the paths of God. God, really, what are you doing? And, and we try to figure it out and we try to go there, and, and, but we can't do it. 
And, and, and then sometimes we try to, to, to figure out or we, or we try to fathom out, if you would, because the word the Bible uses, and, and we find out that his words, his acts are unfathomable. We, 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 can't, we can't do that. And, and, and it's like that old picture of that old computer from back in the early days of computers. And it, I remember the first one I bought, Sam, we bought it over here at Sears and Roebuck. And, and a colored preacher, he was a bivocational preacher, and he, was, he worked in that department. We didn't know what in the world. I didn't know how to turn one on. Nicole was in third grade, something in that, fourth grade maybe, and needed a computer, so we didn't even have one at the church. And we, we just had one of them typewriters with one of them balls on it that had letters all around the ball, and that ball just turned and did all kind of stuff. Well, we went to buy a computer at Sears. And it had eight megabytes, 8K. It had eight, whatever it was, they were laid up. And so I asked him, I said, what does this mean? What does this eight, whatever that thing was? It was the memory that it had. He stood there and he just kind of laughed and he said, Brother Cowart, you will never fill that thing up. <laughs> now, if you, know, if you don't know anything about computer, that... That doesn't mean much to you, but if you know much about computers, you probably couldn't even turn the on and off switch on and make the thing begin to turn on with, with, that, much, with that much memory. And, and, and when we begin to try to trace out the paths of God and we try to, make, we try to fathom out his unfathomable ways, it, it's kind of like that old computer that was made back in the 80s and, and you're trying to put 2020 technology in it and that thing just begins to sit there and smoke and smoke and smoke until it just until it just burns up you see in our life we've begun to walk with God well number one we were saved we began to walk with God like we have never walked with him before but in the in that path of obedience we just come across situations and circumstances and things happen and we begin to wonder why is this happening and what's going on and we try to figure out these things and, and listen we, we just can't it's it's those places in our life where we just have to step back and tell god god i don't understand it's probably not what i would do because i don't know to do what you would do but i'm just going to trust you with what's going on it may not make sense it may not make, people will tell you, well, don't worry about it. if it don't make sense today. You'll understand it tomorrow or next week or next year. Listen, brethren, we may never understand it. We may never understand it. And if we don't, it's okay. It's okay. Because, because God, God knows things. So he's telling his servant Moses, who is probably, if he's anything like us or we're anything like him, he's probably bewildered. He says, Moses, you just go. You just go and you deliver the goods to Pharaoh. He's not going to like it. He's not going to. He's not going to want it. Just, but you bear in mind that 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 I've hardened his heart and and all of those things. And and even though that happens, it does not mean that it's outside of the will of God. So it's inside the will of God. Pharaoh's hard heart is inside the will of God. So in the following verse, in verse 22 and 23, the Lord gives Moses some, some specific instruction about what to say when he hits that proverbial brick wall. Here's verse 22. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son my firstborn. So I say to you, that you as Pharaoh, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Now, I don't care how you cut it, shake it, bake it, or whatever else you do with it. That's a gutsy message. For a guy that's been just sitting on a, I say sitting on it, whatever a shepherd does, 
for him to come out of just tending sheep for 40 years to go before the, the Pharaoh and tell him, these are the words of God, and here's what God told me to tell you. He walks out of the Midianite desert. He walks into the new land. He gets an audience with the king. He's to look him in the eye, and he says, God says, let my people go, because if, if, if you want, your son will soon die. Well, isn't it a good thing that... Now, now, Moses hasn't gone to do this yet. This is just God telling, here's what I want you to do. Here's what you are to do when you get there. Now, it's a good thing that Moses has already settled the obedience issue back there in the desert. Because I've just got a feeling, I can't speak for Moses, I can't speak for Jess, I can't speak for David, I can't speak for Juanita, I can just speak for Steve. Steve would probably have this thing come up within him that says, well, I'm not real sure that this is for me. This may be for somebody else, but this is not for me. You see, when Moses, when he was standing at that bush, and God spoke to him out of that bush. He took his shoes off because he's on holy ground, and God spoke to him, and he goes through, and he gives him the command. He gives him the instruction that he has. You see, Moses has already decided, and he has already settled the obedience issue back there in the desert. And now when God comes here in verse 22 and verse 23, and he tells him, this is what you're going to say when you go to Pharaoh, and his heart's going to be hardened against what, what, we, what, what I'm telling you to say, Moses doesn't argue. He doesn't, we don't find anything in Scripture that would indicate that he even flinches. This is just what God said. Moses has settled that he's going to be obedient. He doesn't argue. He doesn't gripe. He doesn't complain. You say, well, why doesn't he? Because, because of this omnipotent God, omniscient God, had, had God brought Moses to this place 40 years ago, Moses wasn't ready. What Moses needed was Moses needed 40 years sitting out in the wilderness, if you would, the desert, tending them sheep. You see, that 40 years that Moses has been a shepherd for Jethro has changed Moses. And Moses is now, he, he is now ready to be the mouthpiece of God. And, and from this moment on, it seems that Moses has a quiet confidence in his dealings with, with, with the Pharaoh. And because you say, well, why do you think this is so? Because I believe that at this point in time in Moses' life is he knows that he is in the center, the nucleus of the will of God for his life. And brethren, I'm going to tell you something. When you're in the center of the will of God for your life, you just have this quiet confidence. I, I don't look at it as a swagger. I don't look at it as any of those things. I just see it as a quiet confidence that you can stand and you can proclaim, thus saith the word of God. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. It really doesn't matter what they have to say. This is what God has said. I'm in the will of God. I'm doing the will of God. And so I'm just going to tell you what God says. And this is what Moses does. There's a verse of Scripture. We find it in Isaiah, and it sort of helps to explain Moses' spirit, his quiet, calm, peaceful spirit in his life at this time. Here's what the prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah 32, 17. The work of righteousness will be peace, and the effect of righteousness will quietness, and assurance forever. Anything we do for the Lord can be considered, I, I believe, if it's what God calls us to do, can be, can be called the work of righteousness. And when you're doing the work of righteousness, you'll be surrounded with peace. I'm telling you, there can be a storm all around you. 
There can be, in, in, in our earthly storms, there's lightning flashing and thunder rolling and all of these kind of things happening. And man, when we're in the nucleus of the will of God and we're, and we're in that spot, we, we, we oftentimes don't really even notice what's going on around us because, because we're in that place in the work of righteousness where there's peace and quietness and assurance forever. The, the, it, one of the words out of that verse out of, the, out of Isaiah uh, 32, 17 is the word, uh, let, me, let me find it. Uh, the, the newer translations. Use, use the word confidence. It, it, can, it can be better described, not to change the word of God, but it can be better termed uh, security. King James uses, he just uses the word assurance there in the next to last ver- word of that, of that verse, but it, but it can be, it can be secure. And, and it tells us that, 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 man, when we're where God wants us to be, and that's where Moses is at this time, there's a quiet and there's a secure confidence when we're walking in the will of God. Well, that brings us to the, to the next thing on, on, our, on our list. That's the danger of neglect. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, this, what, what this entails is not, is not my favorite subject to preach on. But, but what happens here is this. This is, this is a progression in Moses' life. He's, he's met the Lord there at the burning bush, and he's, he's surrendered to him. He's, he's obedient. He's, gonna begin, he's begun this journey and all of these things. Well, what happens in our life is, is when we have we've made the decision that, We've been saved, and we've made the decision that we're going to follow him. Now, everybody that's saved doesn't follow the Lord. We we know that, okay? Well, Moses has made the decision that he's going to follow him. And when we make the decision that we're going to trust him with all of our heart, and with that verse we read out of Proverbs, the third chapter and the fifth and sixth verse of a few weeks ago where it said, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge or recognize him, and and he will will direct your path or he will make your path uh, uh, smoother. Well, when we've decided to trust the Lord and and, and we're going to live with him or or live for him, then we're we're no longer going to lean on our own understanding. We're not going to lean on man-made crutches. Well, what begins to happen is... God, who is omniscient, so he knows everything, and nothing has just sprung upon him. But what begins to happen is he begins to, I don't know if this is the right word to speak on his behalf, but, but it's as though he begins to go back in our life, and he brings things forward to us for us to recognize that we have neglected. Well, that's what happens with Moses. You see, look, look if you would, at, in, still in the fourth chapter, at the 24th verse. And in the 24th verse, it says this, And it came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met Moses and sought to kill him. Now, I'd jerk some of your heads up right quick. It came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him, Moses, and sought to kill him. Well, what this is going to do is this is going to carry us. Do you ever follow the the scripture references that are in the middle of the page in your Bible? Well, if you do this one, if if you, I don't know if you know this or not, I have to blow my scripture up. I don't mean explode them, but I don't see as well as I used to, so I have to put them in a 14 font so that I can I can't just look down at the Bible and read them anymore but but in that verse in in the scripture when you get down to those last two words kill him it sends you to reference letter C out of out of verse out of that verse number 24 and that takes you to Genesis the 17th chapter and the 14th verse now, the Genesis 17, 14 goes back to the day of Abraham, and, and it's, it's a part of this under that listing of the sign of the covenant there to begin that 17th verse. And he gets to the 14th verse, and here's what Scripture says. And the uncircumcised male child 
who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Now, we, we come to this place, and so to, for God to get Moses' attention, I don't think that he was going to strike him dead. If God wanted to, he certainly could have, but he's got a big job for Moses to do. But I think he makes him very sick. He doesn't have a cold. He doesn't have the crud. He doesn't have a slight fever. I don't know what he has, but he has some sort of an illness. And I would, I would refer to it as a serious illness. Well, man, this, was, this is frightening. Any time for a family, when, when, when a parent or for a parent, if it's the child, if, if somebody's sick, sick, it, it's a wearisome time. So it must have been for the family. Well, in the 25th verse of chapter 4, it says, Then Zipporah, however you say her name, that's Moses' wife, she took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. Now, in the Hebrew, I don't know Hebrew, but I, 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 I read this out and followed it out. In, in Hebrew, what she was saying to Moses, she was saying, You are a bloody groom to me. That, that, that's what she says to, to Moses. Well, you go on in the 26th verse, it says, So he, and that's God, let Moses, let him, Moses, go alone. Then she said, You are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. So at this point, Zipporah, she goes, she, she leaves, goes back to Midian, where, where her father is, where Jethro is at, and the scripture doesn't tell us that, but we surmise that because the Bible tells us in Exodus, the 18th chapter, the second and the beginning of the third verse, it says, Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back, uh, and, and verse 3, it says, with her, with her two sons. So, so most likely, after the circumcision was, was taken care of, that, that I'm... I'm sure that it was rather painful. And they're traveling on donkey back, if you would, and the boy is probably in such pain that he's not able to travel, so, so Zipporah takes him back to Jethro's house and gives him time to, to, to heal up and, and all of these things. I, one of my favorite people to read after, and concordance-wise, is a gentleman by the name of David Guzik, and uh, David Guzik writes about that, and he, and he says this. He says, perhaps Zipporah objected to the rite of circumcision because she was not an Israelite and may have thought that it was a barbaric custom. Perhaps that was, that was why God held Moses accountable for not doing what was right, even though his wife didn't like it. But he disabled Moses so that Zipporah had to perform the circumcision itself. Guzik goes on to say, Some wonder why Moses' wife seems to be so bitter here. Perhaps for the first time, she recognizes the serious nature of her husband's call and how important it is for their whole family to walk in the ways of the Lord. Now, you say, Preacher, what does this mean? Why is this important, and how does this play out for us? This is a, this is a mysterious event, and, and, and I believe that God is confronting Moses simply because Moses had not been obedient in that area of his life. He had, he had not circumcised his son. God demands that before they enter Egypt, before they go and fulfill this task that God has laid before them, I believe that God demands this to be set right, and, and so that's, that's what begins to happen, and, and that's what takes place at this particular time and place in, in his life. So, so there, there, there may be things, and I don't know what they are in, in your life or mine as we begin to to follow the Lord and, and walk with the Lord in, in our lives and, 
and we're saved and probably saved at a much younger age, but sometimes we don't get serious about walking with God for, for a long, long time. And when we begin to get serious about walking with God, sometimes God has to go back and, and reveal some things to us that we've, that we've not taken care of and, and that we've just neglected in our life. And, and you know, if, if God does those things, I, I remember hearing a story. I was, I was pretty young when I heard this story. Preacher at, at our church over at McKendree told this story. And the story went something like this. A preacher went to visit in one of his church members' home. And they were discussing some passage of Scripture, some verse of Scripture. And, and the preacher said, well, go, go bring me your Bible. And so the guy goes in the other room and gets his Bible. And he comes back and, and he opens his Bible. And he just, and the preacher notices, he said, there's just places where passages are just cut out. They're, they're just not there. And he looked at the guy and he said, well, what's, what's the deal? He said, oh, those are just things that I've heard you say weren't very important. You see, we decide. We decide what's important and what's not important. I beg to say that if it's in the council, it's important. I may not understand its importance. I may not recognize its importance, but it's important. And, and, and so... There's, there's, and, and, and I, I, I believe this, even as I'll hit a birthday here in a week or in about 12 days, and as we go on in age and we go on in our walk with God, that sometimes God just comes back along and he reveals something to us that we overlooked. We just, we didn't pay much attention because we didn't deem that it was very important in our walk with God. And sometimes God has to come back and say, now, we need to take care of this. And, and, and if he does, then, you know, however he reveals that to us, then that's what we do. We, we look at this and we say, yeah, but man, wasn't that pretty drastic? Well, in my way of thinking, it was. But he had, he had laid down that this is the way that it's going to be. He had, laid down, he had laid down that law a long, long time ago. Moses didn't deem that it was overly important at that juncture of his life, but God says it is important, Moses. And you're going to have to take care of that. It's going to have to be taken care of before we can, before we can go and, and do what, I, what it is that I'm asking you to do, instructing you to do. So, so, so that's what he does, and, 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 and he takes care of this, uh, of this uh, act in, in his life. Any comment about that? Gary, you, you teach this. <laughs> oh, oh. You know, there's just some past. I'm going to be honest. I can't speak for every preacher. I can just speak for me. But there's they some that we sidestep. And, but uh, anyway, anyway, we'll stop there and we'll cover those next two uh, next, time we, next time we meet. All right? All right, let me, let me update you on how, how people are and things. And I, I was writing this, a verse of Scripture down. I think Eddie asked me, and I wasn't really listening a while ago. But uh, they, they, they let Sonny go home about 3, 3.30 this afternoon. And uh, I, uh, I, I went back to visit with him while I was there uh, this afternoon. And... Uh, he was sharing with me that this was this was the fifth seizure he's had this week, and uh, had Monday, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. I think he had two yesterday, and then this one. And uh, this one, this was the longest. Uh, if you were over there, you could you could kind of see what was going on. But but uh, but this seizure that he had this morning, from the time it happened, it it never. It never stopped. The whole time that he was here, it never, it never fully subsided and went away. But uh, anyway, he was he was awake and talking, and uh, he's he's very. I, was, I shared this with a few people this afternoon. He's uh, uh, as as I think we all would be. He's he's very depressed. Uh, 
uh, to be 19 and you can't drive, and you can't stay by yourself, can't work. Uh, that's a that's a, that's a pretty pretty difficult place to be, and so uh, he he really really needs our really needs our prayers, and uh, he he sees a what's that doctor called that does that neurologist. He sees he sees one in the morning at eight, uh, so I'm I'm not sure uh, what the prognosis will be or anything. Uh, I think they need to go to Houston personally, and uh, they, they they see a lot more things than we see here. And uh, but uh, but but pray pray for him and. Uh, yeah, their, their their whole family has had a sent a message to Donna this afternoon. Because yesterday, Isabella was supposed to sing today. I can't remember if she sent me this message Friday or yesterday, but she sent me a message and she said, uh, she said, will it be okay if before I sing tomorrow? It was yesterday. Be okay if before I sing tomorrow, if I say something about Sonny and just ask the church to pray. And uh, when I realized who it was, I, I thought about that. I thought about that text, and uh, so uh, their, their whole family's had here as of late and the, with the baby, and they were in Houston for a month or so, and and now with and this had been going on for a year and a half, something like that. So uh, we were—I don't know who it was. I think it was Charles and I were talking before church, and most of us don't know. How blessed we are! Till we look, till we begin to look around us, and we don't have to look far. And uh, uh, so, so you uh, you be careful to to keep the keep the family in your in your prayers. Keith Graves told me this morning he fell and thinks he's broken a rib, and uh, he fell yesterday. And I asked him why he wasn't in the choir, and he said, "I can't breathe." So he fell and done done something to his side there, but uh, so uh, remember him. And uh, trying to think who we mentioned this morning. Miss Vanette has a, another back thing, I think, tomorrow. So uh, Sandra's mom, so 99 years old, and uh, so remember her. And uh, let's see, who else did we have? Who? Gail's having her other eye. Which one did you do last week? That one. So get it. And you keep an eye on Jess. A lot better. And uh, who? Rachel. Went, I went by there this afternoon, and uh, she uh, she didn't know I was there. She was kind of out of it, but. Uh, her daughter was there, and uh, so they've, they've. Word came yesterday that they just, they thought she had a UTI when she went in, whatever day that was, Wednesday or Thursday, and uh, they decided yesterday that it was a stroke, and uh, so they're kind of hoping to move her down to first floor to start some kind of a rehab sort of things, and uh, hoping to do that in the next day or two. So, but Brandon wasn't there, so. I didn't. I didn't get to see him. And uh, Paul Roden, uh, Paul and uh, his wife, they've been visiting for some time. And uh, he, uh, she was at church last Sunday morning, and he wasn't with her. And they usually sit kind of right here behind where David is sitting tonight. And uh, so I was at the tax office Friday, and coming out, I run into her, and she said that. Paul had had a heart attack Monday, and a small one, but uh, they're, they're going to do open heart surgery uh, tomorrow. I'm not sure what time, but uh, going to do that tomorrow. And uh, her daddy, what, what was her daddy's name? What was her daddy's name? Brother McBride, A.B. McBride. He preached around here for a long, long time out at uh, Mount Carmel, wasn't it, where he was at? Somewhere out there at Hudson, but uh, uh, remember, remember the 
Roden family in your prayer. Was that, was that all? Diane having sh shoulder on Tuesday. Uh, I don't know if she stays in or if she's going to. It's at an orthopedic place, so I don't know if she's staying. Or outpatient. I, I, I figured that just from the place they were doing it. So. Okay. Somebody else has just got moved over there. Who is it? I don't remember. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Okay. Forty-one-year-old pastor, Crockett area. Forty-one-year-old pastor of a church over there. Three or four small children, liver cancer. So, what was, did you call the name? Casey Stanford, Stafford, Casey Stafford. Okay. All right, that's James's mom. Any more? So Les is, I mean, Jess's cousin, nephew, was here this morning. Yeah. So, what's it? Is it Les? Les. Les, Les and Jess. All right, any more? All right, well, let's stand together. We'll have a word of prayer. Appreciate you. I'd, I'd, I'd heard that a few weeks ago. Is it the same as last time? Same? Wasn't it prostate? So remember, remember Brother John Green in your, in your prayers. Okay? Any, any others? Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. I pray that a portion of this passage of Scripture tonight challenged our heart, challenged our walk with you. Lord, that we would, like Moses, that we would just come to that place where we totally sell out to you, totally committed totally follow you ask your blessings on these we've mentioned for prayer and I certainly couldn't recall all the names again but you're aware of those I ask you to especially bless Sonny I pray you bless his uh, his mindset his depression I pray that uh, I don't know how to ask you to do it. If it's just the presence of your spirit, or if it would be somebody to walk in and, and, and minister to him, how, however that would be, I, w I just ask you to, to bring encouragement to his heart, to his life. I pray your presence to be with him. 
with his mom and dad, his family. Pray for Paul Roden to undergo surgery tomorrow. Pray you'll be with him and see him through the heart surgery and his family as they wait by him. I pray you give healing to him in these days to come for Miss Rachel. Lord, it's a long road they've been on. Just ask you to strengthen and bless Brandon as he sees after and takes care of her. All these other requests are no more or less important because I can't recall the names, but I just ask you to have your will and way in each of those. I ask you to dismiss us under your watch and care. Keep us safe till we meet together again on Wednesday. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.